Let's talk farming in South Africa with Dr. Berlin Chisunge and uh, Deleka Mandela, right here on Rainmakers. So welcome both of you to the show. Thank you. First off, I have to ask just a little bit about your family. You've got a pretty famous name there. You are the first of the first. Yes, I am. And that is the first grand... The first grandchild from the first son from the first wife. And your very famous grandfather, you referred to as... Granddad. And he is he has the charm to be able to charm bees out of the beehive? <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> that he does. <laughs> and Dr. Uh, Chisunge, you have been referred to as passionate about everything that you do. Right? Correct. Yes. Let's talk farming then. Because you are the are the one who was talked uh, about as the, is it Kalahari? Is that how you say it? The Kalahari red o goats? That is correct, yes. All right. Let's talk about goats and farming and what it means to South Africa, what it means to all of Africa, what it means to the world. Well, I um, after having traveled the world and uh, gone to all um, conferences, symposiums, and all different names and the like, uh, one thing that was mainly talked about was uh, food security. And after having looked and searched, there was nobody who was actually implementing it or doing anything on the ground. So I decided to detach myself from there. And, um, and I invested in a farm in South Africa, 414 hectares. I actually bought the so-called Kalari red goats before I actually even bought the farm. So I started with 21 of those and I'm sitting now on over 400 of those goats. Why Kalari red goats? Um, I got them for their attributes. Uh, very maternal, so they wouldn't kid and leave their kid in the mountain. Mm -hmm. They'd always come back home with the kid, unlike a normal goat. And also very well known for their weight capacity. We get some 110, 115 kil kgs. Uh, weight? Body weight, yes. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and also they're very disease resistant, so ideal for the rural setting. You don't need to vaccinate them and um, they key twice a year, so that means you can multiply your profits as well, uh, wow. tweens and triplets that you get. Now, Deleka, your, your role in the farm, but, but you're involved in the urban setting as well as the rural setting too? Yes, mostly the rural setting because I come from the rural Eastern Cape. And um, there was a time when agriculture was very vibrant in the Eastern Cape in the early 70s, 1970s. And um, that subsistent farming helped uh, a lot of rural women, you know, generate an income. And that farming is totally dead right now. And Rural women farming is yeah, dead? Rural, yeah, rural women farming. Oh. I, mean, I, st I grew up in, in, in the Eastern Cape in Kosenvaba and... It's a small village town, and I mean, there were lot of lots of cabbage farms around around the area where people would uh, grow cabbages and sell them to to co-ops and, and industries. But that's dead. So my role also dovetails with Berlin, and in the in the sense that you know, in the rural areas, it will also generate a, a lot of interest and and also you know help those women. A, have a sustainable income. I thought that that women were the were the dominant farmers. That I mean, there were more women who were farming uh, than anyone else in farming. Is is that the way it is in South Africa? Well, um, on the continent, you could say seventy percent of the farming is actually done by women. But really? when it comes to ownership, they own no land. It's a still very much male-dominated area. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and as you know that women are drivers of uh, most things, they'll ensure that a child goes to school but uh, challenges uh, institutions and how um, financial instruments can be um, uh, translated from the institutions to the rural setting I mean like I said to you earlier that uh, it becomes, it poses a serious challenge because mm -hmm. uh, there's a bigger bridge now between a farmer and the institutions and that bridge I'm afraid if it's not mended now or anchored then the 2050 when we're talking about 9 billion we might not actually get there because mm -hmm. uh, the next biggest world war I think is going to be on food and, uh, I'm not sure that I understand about the the dichotomy between the institutions and the farmers. Help uh, explain that oh, more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, perhaps uh, I could explain it a little bit better because uh, in Europe and here you've got uh, subsidies for your farmers. Mm -hmm. 
But in Africa, most uh, countries, or certainly the part of Africa that we come from, there are no subsidies at all. Mm. So we're already disadvantaged getting into the playing field because uh, you're starting off with uh, uh, the cost of your inputs are very high. For example, as a small scale farmer, I pay more for pet honey for my fertilizer compared to the big farmer who is buying more, so he pays less. So as a result of that, I am disadvantaged from the word go. So my yield is not going to be brilliant. It will be very poor because I can't afford the fertilizer because of the cost. Oh, so see. if there are subsidies, then that would definitely help. And some sort of like a synchronization, a farmer's list where everything is done from a hub. And uh, that will certainly benefit. And also, I think what it will do, uh, the more women that are put into these areas, will certainly be able to control the population as well because a woman, if they're given something to do, they don't have time to be making more babies. So perhaps we could also use it as a control for the population that's growing at an mm. alarming rate now. Yeah. Uh, Delaka, is, is that something that's needed then for support for the women so that they can have more choices with their own bodies? Is that it? That's correct. And the fact that, you know, before a child can, can have an education, you need to eat and you need to have you know, good nutrition, and it starts with, with farming, because that's where the food comes from, and also to make sure that, you know, the child is fed before they go to school. In, in so many of the interviews that we've done, not only in this CGI, but in past CGIs and, and all around the world, actually, where we've done interviews, it seems that men in the farming community really don't work as hard as women. Is that right? It's a fact. Why is that? Okay. What's wrong with us? Why are we lazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, hopefully, only if you are lazy, but then giving more power to the women. As you know, a woman, I've summed up a woman as a worker, as an organizer, as a multitask manager, that she can do a lot of uh, things at the same time, and she's also an advocate, and above it all, she's a negotiator. So she negotiate the best price at the market for her product. Mm -hmm. Whereas a man would just simply walk away and say, no, it's fine, for a pint of beer, it's fine. They'll have it. But a woman will make sure that she gets her products worth. And what she'll do, she'll ensure a child goes to school, and she'll mm -hmm. ensure that the husband is fed and so forth and budget for everything, like she rightly said about uh, the children going to school. We all know research has shown that an empty stomach produces nothing so it's a waste of time sending children to school and I just think also was talking about education that is very important to start educating the little ones school going age five-year-olds let them know that in 2050 there's going to be nine billion let them grow up prepared we only in this situation today because the past has not prepared us if the past had prepared us, we would not be talking about food security because we would have budgeted for it as we're growing. Mm -hmm. But it looks like we're very selfish. We're not really focusing on education for the five-year-olds to actually tell them how important it is that they need to have more food, more jobs, more hospitals, improve the roads and so forth so that at least uh, they'll have a better world. So I'm not so sure what uh, we're leaving for the future generations. At the same point in time, you're here because you think you can make a, make a difference, right? Yes. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, my grandfather did a lot for, for, for and I, mean, I feel like I'm the next generation together with my cousins to, mm -hmm. to take the baton forward. And just to add on what Berlin said about, uh, about what you asked about why are men so, so lazy, I mean, in the rural areas, Men usually are migrant laborers. They leave the rural areas to go to the urban areas in the mine, in the mining sector, and it's the women that are left behind in the homesteads to fend for the family. And they do, do that because they're uneducated. They do that through farming and and and, and plowing in their gardens for 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 to make sure that there's there's the sustenance, there's vegetables, and they grow chickens. I mean, that's how my grandmother was, Evelyn. I mean, she grew chicken, she had a, she had a garden, and we grew up eating healthy food because of, of, of the garden that she had. Mm -hmm. So that's the role of women in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. I have a, a good friend here in the United States who is a very well-educated person. He's not as well-educated as you are, uh, Dr. Chisungi, but his job for the past 20 years has been trading in futures. So it's a, a really academic type of, of thing that he does. And he said to me the other day, before I came here, he said, farming is what people should do. I agree with him 100%, but it's how is it to be done? 
there's still that disconnect. I keep referring to that because like now we hear of climate change, we're hearing of the floods and more drought and mm-hmm. everything. And they're talking about uh, drought-resistant crops. They're talking about risk management insurance. But how is that translated to the rural setting? So until we start getting answers of how do we bridge the bridge to get to the rural setting to okay, well, get them to to grow things sustainably let me ask you that question you know how do we fix this give the power to the farmers get us involved what power do the farmers not have for example you i've just come back from vietnam mm-hmm. uh, for the global climate uh, smart agriculture uh, and, um, the second global conference on agriculture and I was the only farmer there, so uh, I actually asked to say, uh, the sponsored candidates, why don't every country bring some farmers? And then whilst the so-called uh, policy makers sit in one room, we could also sit in one room and then come up with what we are doing as farmers and then meet, then we can actually put the things together. Perhaps some of the things that are now being uh, developed and designed as policies, we already may be practicing it. So until we are recognized, I'm afraid we are not going anywhere. It's just uh, another lonely journey that will continue to be on. And like I said earlier, they talk of value added chain, but it's not a chain for us. It's a train where we merely pass our passengers sitting Mm -hmm. and looking at uh, the others benefiting from us. We want to be recognized and... uh, we want financial institutions to come to us. We certainly need skills transfer. We need to be powered with education. Delica, I think you said it. There's really nothing more valuable on the earth than food. Mm-hmm. Um, why is it then that farmers don't have more power, do you think, inside our own economic systems? Well, it's mainly because they don't. I mean, I'll talk specifically of the rural farmers. I mean, they don't have the finance like Ravina said, mm-hmm. they don't have the financial So they need to be part of the banking yes, system? Yes, they need to be part of the banking system. And also they don't have the markets. They will, they will have their produce, but who do they, do they sell their produce to? Mm-hmm. So they need to have, you know, as as when they farm, they need to have offtakes of people that are going to take their produce from them and to be able to have a sustainable income. From a food security standpoint, there is a, is a big discussion uh, here at CGI about new preservation techniques. In, in, uh, is there... Is there a lot of produce that doesn't get to market because you're just not able to keep it fresh long enough? Um, definitely, most definitely. You see in Africa there's a lot of food that is going to waste. You see it on the sides of the road and uh, they go there and stand for hours and hours in this food in the sun. And obviously now, uh, due to all these diseases like cholera and so forth, so mm-hmm. all the uh, food becomes susceptible to infection and disease and so forth. And uh, I just think that uh, um, there's a need now to take stock of what we're doing. Because if we don't act now, then I'm afraid it's going to be too late. And of course, like I said earlier, uh, the buyer, if I was in the buyer's shoes, I want to be guaranteed produce. If I want 10,000 tomatoes every Tuesday, I would like 10,000 tomatoes every Tuesday. But now as a small-scale farmer, how am I going to guarantee that? So Mm -hmm. we will remain disadvantaged. The big farmers, commercial farmers, are the main beneficiaries of it all because then they can guarantee quality and they can guarantee the product because they have a central seed bank where they get their seed and it's tested and uh, all the controls, the technology you're talking about. Whereas a small-scale farmer has no access to all this. So there are no institutions they talked about on paper, but they don't really exist actually. So uh, it, it's a, it's quite a serious problem. I have hosted the Germans on my farm with the 20 EU member delegation, and I explained to them to say what they produce on 50 hectares. I need a thousand hectares to produce the same amount of yield. Why is that? Oh, the implementations, uh, the implements that they're using. I mean, the John Deere tractor that you're using here now today. It's going to mm-hmm. take me the next 10, 20 years to be able to afford it. So we're never going to be on the same page. So we are saying, why don't we all come together as one world for the common cause and uh, work together and uh, see where we can find some synergy, group the small-scale farmers together, create central seed banks where they can get fertilizers, insurance, where they can get finance and so forth. Because then that's the other thing is all about finance. What am I going to put down as collateral? You're going to come and give me a loan, but obviously you want to know how am I going to pay you back? So if I don't have a market, 
or if I don't have anything to guarantee your loan, you're not interested in me. No. Why would you be interested in me? Yeah, that's true. Mm. Um, Adelica, in uh, South Africa, can women own land? Yes and no. It is very... Actually, no. Yes, they can own land, but how they... they, they, they it's, it's mainly, a, you know, commercial farmers that, that do own land. And mm. the previous... Uh, from the previous... Because in South Africa, it's mainly Afrikaners that have the land and that are, that are farmers, but certainly not, not African farmers. So it is difficult for Africans to break into that industry because the, the walls of barrier are too high. Like like Berlin said, you know, you don't have collateral when you go to a bank and say that this is the land that I've identified, this is the land that I want. What collateral do you have to be able to secure that loan, to buy that land? None whatsoever. Is there a movement in South Africa for women to be able to own land legally? Not really. Not really. <laughs> like I have to buy. I, I bought my own land. It's not uh, without any help from any financial institutions or from the government either. And it is actually very capital intensive. So, and also, what is more important, uh, we can talk about the land. Perhaps you can have access to grandfather's land or grandma's land. But what do we do with the land? We've yeah. never farmed before. This has been an area, whether we like to admit it or not predominantly more for the whites that have been farming for years and years. But right now, we're not transferring the skills. We're not working together. So we are saying, I have actually basically something to say to whoever is intending on grabbing the land, perhaps if they can grab the skills first and mm. then grab the land and bring it to us. Because there's no point just even getting the land and not knowing what to do with it. It's extremely difficult. We've got a lot of uh, farms right now, even in South Africa and other countries, lying fallow. Nothing really? being done on it. This, yes, is correct. Mm. Is farming mm. something that that people are willing to go into in South Africa who are at the low end of the pyramid right now, or are they just not because it's so diff too difficult to make a living? There's no incentive. There's no incentive because I mean, the, mm. in South Africa, no, the, there's a there's a there's a policy that said willing buyer, willing seller, but I mean, there's there are no willing buyers and there are certainly no willing sellers, and I mean, for 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 the African people. For, you know, because they don't have access to finance, and they don't see it as a as a lucrative business, because they've always been on the other side, that tilling the land but not owning it, and mm -hmm. there's, there are no skills to actually, if you are given a farm, and to actually till the land and 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 make it uh, profitable. Mm -hmm. Is this all through? the southern part of Africa, I'm not talking in South Africa now, mm -hmm. I'm talking the southern part of Africa, or is, is just how far does this go? It, cr it crosses across the continents actually. Mm -hmm. Like I just said, I just come from Vietnam, they're also having the same problems, but what they have done is uh, due to land, uh, they don't have much land, so they've now resorted to the latest technology, intensive farming, like uh, fish tunnels and uh, everything being done on an intensive basis, which has really helped a lot. And uh, I think they're making headways. So we're still lagging behind in Africa. And as you know, we are the bread baskets, actually, that we can produce enough food to feed the billions of people that are in the world. And, and those and, to come. Many, many more to come, but until we organize ourselves, then uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge. Maybe the governments need to, <laughs> because what we're finding is the disconnect between the governments. Like I said earlier, that uh, the government have uh, summed up some of them as um, actors, really, because they uh, present us when we're with them, when they want our votes. They'll tell us they'll give us tractors and they'll improve the roads, they'll improve the irrigation systems. But the minute they assume state positions, they cease to represent the constituencies they've been drawn from, which is a tragedy because they now in power, they forget all those things that they've promised people. So uh, the money that comes, it ends up for political mileage, if it goes to institutions, it's for their bank balances, and unfortunately, the farmer gets no access to it. So perhaps if people could look at means where things are centralized and create a farmer's role to be able to know how many farmers are there in every country and what is uh, uh, how can they be assessed and so forth and uh, also just on it uh, stand to talk about 
soil sampling, the water quality and so forth, it's all part of the whole thing on agriculture, so to be able to guarantee quality. So basically and a, a it, comprehensive holistic program oh. uh, from an agricultural standpoint to see how much can be <coughs> produced from the land by the farmers who live there. That is correct. And also what can be produced there. Uh, I can, it's all right for me to say I want to grow potatoes. What if the land is not suitable for potatoes? No. Could be for ranching. Mm-hmm. As we wrap up here, let's look mm-hmm. Let's look five years down the road. Mm-hmm. You clearly are both very, very strong-willed uh, in what you're doing. You're five years down the road. How successful have you been, and what do you still yet have yet to do? Well, it's a journey, a tough journey. Like I said earlier, it's a lonely journey. But as we now come to platforms like this and meeting with the likes of yourselves and uh, we connected with quite a lot of uh, uh, other people earlier, so we're beginning to exchange information on this platform. So it's also opening our eyes to new opportunities where we can find some synergy and uh, across the divine where I think uh, if we can get more of this, I think we can certainly eradicate poverty together. Uh, for me, it is a journey that I'm, st- I'm, I'm just beginning to walk, and um, certainly it starts with uh, nutrition, which is where farming comes into into space, but also extending through education, which is my passion. Okay, we thank you both very much. Thank you very much, Agnes.